Welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and today we are joined by the one and the only Michael Francis. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You are. There you go. All right. Mark. All right. <clears throat> cool, man. So first of all, it's an honor to have you on here. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel. And for my listeners out there, if, if you're at all interested in hearing a little bit of a true firsthand account about the life that Michael was a part of many, many years ago, ch go check out his channel. Also, if you're a fan of movies, go check out his channel. Michael does really interesting, insightful breakdowns of television shows and movies, typically the ones that pertain to sort of the mobster lifestyle. But, um, you know, I can tell you're a big, big, uh, you know, movie fan. And I kind of want to start there with you because I became obsessed with this great Paramount television show. I don't know if you've seen it called The Offer. I, I have seen it. And, uh, I agree with you. It's extremely well done. Yeah. And like one thing about the offer that I think um, I just didn't look, I'm a huge fan of the Godfather movies of uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Gordon Willis, all the people that put that together. But I think the story that they were telling in that movie about, you know, the, the Italian league and Joe Colombo and his influence into the making of the Godfather is something that I think, kind of touches has a lot of crossover with your experience and i know you know um there's a lot we can get to but i'd love to kind of start on that and like to see if if you have any kind of memories or insights into the making of the godfather or what that was like for you and your culture when that was happening sure and, and first let me say this i thought it was um it was a limited series i think there was 10 episodes extremely well done uh, the, the acting was tremendous. The script was well written. Um, I have nothing but good things to say about it. Uh, having said that, is it 100% accurate? Uh, no. And the reason I say that, that was my era. And I was very close with Joe Colombo. Uh, mm. You know, I grew up with Joey. Uh, my dad was his underboss. And I was very close to the league, um, the Italian American Civil Rights League. Uh, because I initially felt it was a way to help my father get out of prison. So mm -hmm. and during that time, uh, Joe Colombo was pretty active in having a say in the script of The Godfather. He did eliminate the word mafia from the mm -hmm. script. Uh, he did, at one point in time, use the unions to shut down the production because uh, they hadn't reached a, an agreement, and a lot of people were worried that uh, the film was going to be disparaging to Italian Americans. Uh, and that was the whole league thing was that, you know, we were being, uh, you know, unfairly uh, prosecuted because of our name. Um, and so I was very, I was intimately involved in that. I, I remember when Al Ruddy came down to uh, the Italian American Civil Rights League um, rallies that we used to have, or meetings, I should say, at the Park Sheridan Hotel. So, yeah, I was very familiar with it. Having said that, I was a little bit upset in episode one when Giovanni mm. Ribisi, who played Joe Colombo, I thought he he made Joey look kind of uh, buffoonish. Mm. And that wasn't the case. Joey was, uh, you know, an intelligent guy and he carried himself well. But Giovanni, he, he got into the role really well and I thought he cleaned it up good and, and I actually liked it. So, you know, um, yeah, very familiar. There is truth to that. Uh, of course, this was seen through the eyes of Al Ruddy, the uh, sure. producer. So, you know, I'm sure he made himself look, uh, you know, yeah. a little better than maybe the, the true story. But but it was great, you know, and I encourage people. I did a review on it and I encourage people to to watch it. I'm sure they'll enjoy it. I was upset when it ended. It was. Yeah, that yeah, good. me too. I was like, give us the Godfather, too. You know, there has to be a story there. You know, even though Al Ruddy actually only worked on Godfather one and then he uh, he moved on and started working on other stuff. Did you ever get a chance to meet Al Ruddy? Yeah, you know, we, we spoke and we had the same agent at one time. And, uh, oh, wow. Al Ruddy, yeah, Al Ruddy has said after that experience, he will never, ever get involved in another mob-related <laughs> movie again. And he never did, you know. So, yeah, it was it was kind of – it took its toll on him, both from the studio end and from the street end, you know. Uh, but Francis, on the other hand, you know, he, he did a brilliant job with Godfather 2. Uh, he didn't want to do Godfather 3. Mm. Uh but the studio wanted him to do it, and he did it. And I thought that was certainly the weakest of the, of the trilogy. Sure. I didn't, I didn't care for it at all. But um, yeah, it's a great story. And look, it, it, the Godfather had an impact 
uh, guys on the street started to carry themselves differently after that movie came out. Mm. You know, they were dressed differently. They were, they were not, not everybody, but a lot of the guys. So in many ways, it set the tone for all of the movies that came afterwards because it elevated the mafia in people's minds here, not only here in America, but across the world, I believe. So it was a tremendously impacting film. Yeah, it kind of uh, romanticized the mafia into a kind of an American version of a monarchy of sorts, right? It gave us like, you know, like Americans have always grown up in this kind of democratic society. And, you know, the Godfather kind of gave us this thing that there's these little subcultures of very powerful social groups that function like the old kings and queens. And, and you can get those like Shakespearean style of narratives with these like closed little groups. And it's very romantic to, to be the king, you know, and, and like, um, you know, the, the mafia um, lends itself very well to adapt its stories to Shakespearean style kind of tragedies of like Kings and Queens and stuff. But two things that I've been dying to ask you, and, and I apologize if everybody asks you this about the offer specifically is in the offer, it represents Al Ruddy as, and, and Joe Colombo as actually growing in this very interesting relationship where they became quite close in the movie. And I have no idea to know if that was actually the case or not. But even when, um, you know, when Ruddy, uh, in the movie, they represent that Ruddy was actually there on that day in Columbus Circle where he was, you know, shot and assassinated. And that Ruddy took this all very personally. What is that? Is there any truth to that, or was that completely dramatized for the for the show? Yeah, I believe that was dramatized. It was. Uh, I don't want to say blown out of proportion, but it, it was dramatized. I didn't see that. Now, of course, I didn't see everything. Joe Colombo was the boss, and I wasn't privy to everything that was going on. Um, I will tell you that the scene uh, when Joey was killed, uh, well, shot, not killed. He eventually died from the wounds. Uh, mm. That wasn't played out well. I mean, I was 12 stop, steps away from Joey when oh, the shot. Oh, wow, started. you were there. Yeah, I was there. I was. Uh, we had about 50,000 people there that day, but I had just walked. We had a huge stage at Columbus uh, Circle there, and he, he had called me up to the stage, and his son Anthony and Joey Jr. were there, and, and he handed me some brochures, and he wanted me to hand them out, um, you know, by the Central Park. And I was a captain in the league at that point. You know, they, we had these little pins and they met as captain because I was very active. And uh, he said something, his last words to me, I had been a little bit disappointed that the league wasn't doing it enough to help my father who was framed to get out of prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, he handed me those brochures and he looked at me and he said, uh, don't worry, Mike, the league is going to help your dad. Oh, and wow. I was like, really elated. And I said, thank you, Joey. And I hugged him and I walked about 12 steps to go down the stairway to the ground. And that's when the shots rang out. Oh man. He so was, was shot in the back of the head in the movie, in the series. It comes from the front. From the front. Yeah. Now he was shot in the back of the head and uh, he lingered for about seven or eight years. He was in a coma basically the whole time. And then he passed on. So I don't remember seeing Al Ruddy there that day. Um, not going to say he wasn't. I can't say that, but I don't remember him being there that day. And I think the uh, the relationship was exaggerated. It wasn't that. Right. Yeah, because but, like the you know because it's great for drama, right? Like you know, there's yeah. two people that have nothing in common that find common ground and then become friends, right? It, it's it, it's beautiful for the screen. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, with with. When, when The Godfather um, was actually uh, released, you know, there's this great scene in the show where, like, they did this kind of private screening that was supposedly, like, the premiere, but it really wasn't the premiere. Did you go to the act this famous, now infamous screening of The Godfather that was, like, all the, uh, the sort of family folks in there? No, I, I didn't go. I knew about it, but uh, <laughs> right. at that time, but uh, th that did happen. There was a the private screening was promised, and it did happen, and people were actually raving about it. You know, the the thing with the Godfather it, that's been a, it, they've been able to do this with the Godfather. Not many other movies that followed is that the the um, character of Don Corleone, Marlon Brando, who played that brilliantly, sure, and also Al Pacino. 
I mean, in life, these were bad guys as far as the business and the criminal activity. But, mm. you know, as far as family, there was integrity, there was honor, there was respect. And because of that, um, and it was at such a high level, people were rooting for these bad guys. And that's what elevated the position of that mm. life to that degree. You know, the honor, the respect. I mean, the opening scene, you know. Sure. Uh, I mean, everything about it was just so brilliantly done. I mean, it's it's probably, I mean, not probably. For me, it's one of the best movies ever made and ever will be made. It was that I agree. Great. I agree. So now I was going to get off The Godfather, but you reminded me about one thing that I got to ask you. In the show, it represents that Luca Brazzi was played by a Colombo family member. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Lenny Montana actually... Uh, after the film was made and after, uh, you know, Columbus Circle and all that happened, uh, Lenny came out to California where I was at the time I was doing work. And he actually worked with me and a good friend of mine, uh, Jerry Zimmerman. And uh, so I got very close to Lenny after that. But, yeah, he was he was one of our guys. He was a street guy at that time. And the way they talked about, you know, the way Lenny got that role was exactly the way it happened. So that was, <laughs> that was true. Yeah, he was a character, big guy, you know, scary looking guy. And uh, uh, but he, he was uh, he was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with him. So one, one thing that I find very interesting about your life is that, you know, um, you you also um, had a bunch of legitimate businesses, restaurants, car dealership. And one of the things, you know, kind of to segue into that is that you had a film production company. And I believe you made a film called Nights on the Streets or uh, Nights in the City. Yeah, Knights of the City. Knights of the City. So did you get into the movie business as a kind of a consequence of the Columbo involvement in The Godfather that kind of opened your eyes to that potential industry? Or how did that sort of come about? No, Mark, I uh, had nothing to do with The Godfather. You know, and to make a very long story short that I had told, uh, you know, a few times before, uh, this fellow that I just mentioned, Jerry Zimmerman, who I paired up yep. with Lenny Montana later, got himself in some real trouble here in um, in New York, I should say, in New York. And um, it, there was a sit down that I had over him with another made guy uh, that was very upset with what Jerry did. Mm. And I settled it all at the sit down. But this was an older guy. who was a captain with another family. And I said, Jerry, I don't trust this guy. He was so upset that you might be walking down the street and a safe falls on your head. So I want you to go out to, go out to California for a couple of months until I make sure this is done with and this guy doesn't pull a fast one. Wow, that sounds intense. And, yeah, and his brother was out in California selling cars because Jerry was in the car business. So I sent him out there. And a few months later, he calls me up and he says, hey, Chief, we're going to be in the movie business. And I said, <laughs> what do you know about movies? And he says, well, I got a script and uh, – I got some actors. He said, send me $83,000 and, and you're my partner. So I sent him $83,000. And uh, long story short, about a million dollars later. Uh, <laughs> right. That's the movie business. That's the business. We produced a film called Mausoleum. Okay. And, um, you know, the funny thing about that, that's how I got started in the business. Because I took that film. We spent a million bucks on it. I went to Golan and Globus at the time. They had Canon Films. And I said, I want you to distribute this film. And they said, okay, Mike, we can give you 25 grand up front. I said, I don't think you heard me. I just told you I put a million dollars in this film. And they said, yeah, and they explained it to me. So I started to get an understanding of the movie business. So at that point, I kept the film and I bought into a distribution company out in California called Motion Picture Marketing. Mm. And that's how I started in the business. I made about 30 films after that. Oh, that wow. Was, that's a lot. Yeah, mostly exploitation films. You know, the you know the funny thing, Mark. This is crazy. I have been earning money on Mausoleum uh, since it came out. As a matter of fact, somebody just owed me. It's a cult film. It's right. a terrible film. It didn't scare anybody but me. I, I, I don't, <laughs> but, I've never seen it. Yeah, I just got a big offer. You know, a fairly significant offer oh, wow. for another company to take the film and distribute. It's a crazy. It's crazy business. So that's how I got involved in it. That's cool. That's cool. And did you ever, um, because it sounds to me from everything that I know about, you know, I have you a little bit of a disadvantage because I, I do listen to your videos. And again, I recommend 
Everybody go check out his YouTube channel. It's got a big, vibrant community. It's it's quite the achievement that that you've built something that big, and and uh, you know I applaud you for that. But Thank did you ever have any personal kind of passion projects or stories that you wanted to tell in the movie business, or did you just see it as a pure business, X's and O's, money in, money out? If I don't have enough profit, you squeeze, you know, like was it purely X's and O's, or did you have any sort of passion in it? No, you know, initially I, I didn't. I mean, I wanted it. I wanted to put content in there that was kind of uplifting and had a bit of a message, but was gritty and you know realistic. And that's where the film Knights of the City came from. Um, actually, um, I was approached. It was a gang-related film. Smokey Robinson approached me. He had his him and a friend uh, Leon Isaac Kennedy. I don't know if you remember Leon. No. Jane Kennedy did a number of films. So they came to me with this screenplay. And it was gang related. And actually, we had Sammy Davis play an old gangster who was oh, wow. during the young gang people on the street. So I, I liked it. And uh, we produced that film and distributed. Uh, I produced it in Florida. It was a film that I met a young woman uh, who's now my wife of 38 years. So she was oh, a dad. Wow. Film. So that had a major impact on me. But the only other project that um, over the past 20 years, Mark, people have been coming to me to make a movie on my life. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I'd be concerned creatively with how that turned out. And um, I've refused it many, many, many times. But, you know, without getting into the detail, could I can't. I just recently made a deal on uh, on a movie based upon my life. And it's actually a TV series to follow. Oh, so, wow. yeah, we have. The strike. Yeah, thank you. We have the strike now. Um, but it'll, you know, it'll be sometime next year that it should go into production. I'm excited about it. I worked very hard with the writer on it. And uh, I think it's going to be a good project. And um, uh, for me, it's all about authenticity. You know, if I'm going to make a movie, a, a mob movie, it's got to be authentic or why sure, bother? Sure, so I mean, look, there's a lot of pressure on you because you're, you're not just a an interesting guy yeah. like a Joe Pistone or something. Uh, you have a lot of there's a lot of knowledge about you because of your YouTube channel and all the stories you've shared, the expectations for, for realism are much higher. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And we'll capture that. You know, the writer is terrific. He, he gets it. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with him, so I, I think it's going to be, and, and, and of course it's all about execution, director and actors. Sure. So we're going to be authentic actors, and uh, we already started that process. So it's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited about it. That's cool. Can you disclose whether or not it's like your production company in the mix, or it's completely third party? Yeah, it's third party. I mean, I have a you know a fairly big role in it, but it's uh, it's third party. Yeah, cool. It'll be a studio cool. production. You know, um, speaking of Joe Pistone, I know that he, you and him uh, over the years. I only know this because I've heard you say it on on. On video, but you and him actually established a friendship, um, and you would consider your, you know, him, uh, and you know, and you friends, you know, to this day. From what I've heard about you, I'm just hearing this, you know, from you on videos. Um, th there, there was actually a movie that I was working on, uh, which was a spiritual sequel um, to. Um, oh my God, I can't believe I'm blanking on the on the on the Joe Pistone movie. Um, Tony Brasco. Tony Brasco. Donnie Brasco. Um, uh, Donnie Brasco, I'm sorry. And and the movie was about um, the Bath Avenue uh, crew, which I don't know if you're familiar with, or, or, or I'm sure you've probably heard, you know, heard the name, because yeah. after uh, Pistone took down uh, the Bonanno family, the, as I understand it, and, you know, we wrote a, a really interesting script about it, the Bonannos were removed from um, from the commission. Is that That's correct, right? Uh, for a short time, yeah. And then there was like a little power vacuum in that area of Brooklyn that the Bonanos were sort of involved with. And there was this little crew of like 20 year old kids called the Bath Avenue crew. So it's kind of like a young guns style, you know, mobster movie, but in the nineties, um, during that period of time, were you like living in New York or, or is that when you were away? Yeah. Well, no, I was around for a while. And then, um, you know, I had made my decision. I took a plea and, and went to prison. Uh, but I'm familiar with the situation. And and uh, they were talking about, you know, um, blending the Bonanno crew into the other five families. And, mm -hmm. and actually, I mean, the uh, Bonanno family uh, taking them and blending them into the other five families. There was resistance to that, of course. And uh, 
the Bonanos eventually won, won out and they remained a family, a viable family and, and got their uh, uh, position back on the commission. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could have been an interesting story. And look, I, I'm very friendly now with Joe Pistone. Yeah. And sometimes people question that. And I say, look, you know what? Uh, Joe Pistone was an FBI agent doing his job. Right. And uh, at that time, he did his job better than we did ours. Let's right. let's he and uh, I got to know him. I only met him once during that time. I'm fortunate oh, for that. Oh, you actually met him when he was undercover. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I met him one time. He came down to my auto dealership with with someone. We spent about two hours together just talking. And um, I always tease him about that. I said, I'm glad you didn't. Uh, you didn't stay with me and you got off of the Columbos and went to the Bananos because we were all been in trouble. But Oh, uh, wow. So so he was already embedded by the time you met him. He was already in with Lefty and the Sunny, oh, yeah. sunny Red. Yeah. And, Absolutely. So, right, right. That's amazing. And, uh, but we become good friends. I have a lot of respect for Joe. I uh, like him a lot. And uh, we've become good friends over the years. We've done a number of things together. And uh, he's just a good guy. You know, I'll be honest with you, Mark. I have I have friends with a lot of I become friends with a lot of law enforcement people, and not because I share information. It's none of that stuff. And you know, people always say, "Oh, Michael, you must have did this," and then, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're friends. You know, they're just people. They're good people. I have uh, I have uh, law enforcement agents reaching out to me all the time uh, that want to come on the YouTube channel and tell their story. Right. And I'll, I'll be doing that with a few coming up. You know, so. Um, you know, there are people and, and listen, I, I, I'm not going to get into the, uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on in politics and law enforcement today that a lot of the agents and people that I knew are not happy with, you know, and they want to express that. And yeah. I think without it's getting very frustrating, it's a, it's a tough situation we're living through right now. I agree. Uh, but yeah, Joe's a great guy. Great guy. Yeah. You know, what, one thing, um, that that's really impressive about your life is that, you know, and, and I want to be careful with my words here because, you know, but anyway, uh, I'm just going to speak from the heart because I'm coming from a good place is, you know, there's been this kind of public um, uh, sort of. Hey, hey, Mark. Yeah. Mark, hold on. You froze. You froze for about 10 seconds on me. So just whatever you were saying, you can start it again. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So, so basically what I'm saying is, in the public, there's been this kind of media positioning of sort of you versus Sammy, right? And, you know, there's great yeah. videos out there. We won't get into that, but there's some great videos out there for you guys to check out. And I think you handled yourself extremely well. And it made my respect for you go even higher because you don't, you know, you don't really take crap from nobody if you don't agree with what they're representing about you. It, it, and I can appreciate that. But I think the, the core difference between the two sort of characters is that in your story, it seems like you did everything honorably, right? Like you you, you had your gas business, you got in trouble for that, you did your time, you did some hard time, like famously now 27 um, you know, months or, or whatever it was in solitary. You know, you you took your plea deal, but you never gave anybody up. You 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 did it on the up and up, as it were. You know, you paid your price you know, to society, you came out and now you have your independent life and you did something that I think people thought was impossible to do, which is to sort of get out of this life, pay your due to society and come out of it without being in the, you know, in the program, right? Just like you say, like there's only two ways out, right? In a coffin or in the witness protection program. And you seem like you found the third way. Like, was that, how did that even happen? Was that just you, you know, like, like, like the proverb says, just trusting in the Lord or it, it, it's quite an amazing feat. Yeah, Mark, you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because there's so much speculation. And I know, you know, uh, in the sit down that I had with Sammy, let, let me tell you what happened to me during that sit down. I sure. reverted back to myself in that life. <laughs> Right. And, you know, what Sammy did at that sit down would never happen in real life. He got out of hand and he, you know, challenged me and all of that never happened. In those sit downs, we were respectful of one another. And if we weren't, we immediately lose the argument. And if you go too far in that regard, you could pay some serious consequences because we didn't disrespect one another. 
So I conducted myself as if I was in a real sit down. That's how it would have been. So when he right. got out of hand, it was like, are you kidding me, Sandy? Sammy, you know? But aside from that, you know, there was a little uh, dramatic uh, liberty that he took there. I get it. We yeah. became friends after that. And oh, did you really? Oh, oh. Yeah, I mean, no, we settled things. Look, uh, you know, his son, uh, he, he's got he's got a wonderful family. I like them all. And I understand Sammy. You know, I get it. So, And I told him, you know, by us, a lot of the guys online now, by disputing with one another, really all we do is make – everybody look bad we make the life look bad and it's not that i'm trying to glorify the life i'm not but it is what it is it wasn't all bad and it wasn't all good and probably there was a little bit more bad than there were good but i had a lot of friends in that life and when the government came to me and wanted me to cooperate i didn't want to hurt anybody they offered mm -hmm. me the witness protection program because i told them look i'm out of the life and when i said that it was like the magic thing for them oh okay this guy's ready to cooperate Right. And it wasn't that. But, you know, walking, I had to walk a line because you got to understand this, Mark. I had seven indictments against me. I was mm -hmm. a major, major target. When I got that 10 years and $15 million fine, uh, the plea that I took, there was no cooperation involved in that at all. That was it. But the government finally had a conviction on me. And I knew that once that was over, they were going to come down on me harder. Now I already have a conviction. They would have never let me go. So I had to try to think how I was going to walk away from this life without hurting anybody. Mm. Because I wouldn't do that and I wouldn't betray my father to that regard. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disgrace him in that regard in that life. So what did I do? Yeah, I talked to the agents. You know, people talk about the case that I uh, was brought on the stand in the Norby Walters case. I was subpoenaed to go there. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Norby Walters. I am a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the honest truth there is that I was Norby's partner. I gave him a whole lot of money. He was threatening people in my name while I was in prison, using my father and my brother. And when I found out, when the agents came to me, they took me out of prison and they were bringing me in to testify. And I said, guys, I was in jail the whole time. I don't know what he's doing and threatening people. I said, I don't know. I said, I was not willing to have Norby Walters give my father, my brother, and myself more grief because we supported Norby for 30 years. Mm. You know, and, and three times I saved Norby's life. There's a guy by the name of Tommy Vastola that wanted to hurt Norby because Norby was doing some things that weren't right. I stepped in, saved his life. My former boss, Persico, wanted to kill Norby because Norby was using our name and never paying the money that he was supposed to pay. I saved his life a second time. Wow. Third time, my father comes home from prison. We have a sit down with Norby in the stage delicatessen. And Norby, my father says, Norby, I'm your partner. And Norby says, no, you're not. And my father wanted to kill him. And oh, I man. stepped in and saved him a third time. Yeah. So nobody cared about Norby Walters on the street. Nobody. So when the feds finally subpoenaed me, I said, hey, bring me in. I'll tell the truth. I didn't make any deal. I didn't get out of prison. I, none of that stuff. And I told the truth. I said, look, I gave the guy $250,000. I was his partner. If he was shaking down athletes, I'm in prison. I don't know what he was doing. And that's exactly what I said. I was on the stand maybe a half an hour. But what people don't understand, 25 people testified against Norby. Athletes, people from Notre Dame. That's what got him convicted. But he never did a day in jail. Not one day. So right. because of that, Mark, people say, oh, you cooperated. Well, if you want to say I cooperated, I cooperate. I don't care. I don't mm -hmm. care about that tag. But did I put any of my guys in prison? Did I say things about people? Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. So Sammy, and you know, just to verify that, and you gave me the opportunity to say this. You can edit what you want, but I'm, I'm uh, you know, you are nice no, enough. No, no, please, to please. You know, this is an open forum. John Gleason. Uh, who was my prosecutor at one time, he then became, uh, uh, he was the one that prosecuted John Gotti and put John Gotti in prison. Mm -hmm. And then he became a federal judge. Well, just recently, John wrote a book about the whole Gotti situation. You should read it. It's a great book. And John's a good guy. But in the book, he says straight out, Michael Franzis manipulated the government, took us to the cleaners. We never got anything out of him. <laughs> right. That's exactly what I did. I right. made the 
think I was going along, but at the end of the day, I never did. What was my payback for that? They violated my parole, put me back in prison, and put me in a hole for 29 months and seven days. That's how they got even on me. But at the end of the day, it was the best thing that happened because I never hurt anybody. When I got out of prison, I told everybody, I said, listen, you know I could have put a whole bunch of guys in prison. I never did. And my father went to Persico and said, hey, my son never did anything wrong here. He, he manipulated the government. He's walking away from that life because he don't, doesn't want to destroy his family. And that's the end of it. And that's how it ended. Nobody yeah. came after me. Nobody, because they knew I didn't hurt anybody. And they were all in jail anyway. They all had their own problems. Yeah. And, and I think that this is really, from my perspective, the kind of the most monumental part of your story from my perspective, I'm not saying it, it, it's like that for you, but when you were in this horrible hole of hell, in this you know deep isolation, the story that I've heard you tell is that one of the guards uh, handed you a handed you a Bible, and um, while you were in you know in complete isolation for all this time, that you actually found a lot of sort of you know what's the good word like sort of maybe. Um, comfort or peace in, in the Bible and, and that kind of changed your life forever, right? It, it really sort of set you on a completely different path and gave you different superpowers as it were. Well, you know what it did, Mark? I mean, look, I spent three years basically studying not only the Bible, but studying other faiths. And because there was a time when the feds were so upset with me, they said, we're indicting you on a new charge. You're never going to see the street again that I thought I was going to die in the hole. That was it. So me being a rational human being saying, okay, is there something more than this earth? Is there an afterlife? And I started to study Christianity and other faiths because mm -hmm. I said, if I'm gonna die in here and there is a heaven and hell, I wanna know where I'm going. <laughs> right. so what happened is Christianity made my research, it made the most sense to me. And I started to believe in the truths of scripture. And I started to look for corroboration to that. I had my wife send me books in on archaeological, archaeological discoveries of, you know, uh, that supported the truth in the Bible, the fact that the Bible was really mm -hmm. written you know, by the by the 40 authors that wrote it. So a lot of that came into play. So what happened is I became a person of faith. Now, I want to explain that. I mm -hmm. believe 1000 percent in Jesus Christ as being my savior. And I am a Christian 1000%. Does that make me perfect? No. What it did is it changed my accountability, meaning mm. now I'm accountable to God. So there's things that I won't do because I'm not supposed to do them. And I don't want to get in trouble again. I don't want to violate my faith. But do I make mistakes at time? Am I human? Do I curse every once in a while? Do I get angry? <laughs> Uh, I can be honest with you right now, if I had an opportunity to get back into the gas business and defraud the government without getting in trouble, I would do it in one second. <laughs> right. right. No I'm trying to figure out how I can figure out how to do that. That sounds like a good yeah. racket, the whole gas business thing. I have no moral issue with that because I think the government is, uh, they're a bunch of thieves and they're oh, just screwing us left and right and using taxpayer money to enrich themselves. So I don't think that's morally unacceptable to take some of that money and use it for a good purpose. So, you know, so I'm not perfect in that regard, but I am accountable to God at this point, And I try to live my life as best I can in that way. And is because, you know, one, one little last anecdote about, about New York, you know, so I, I moved to New York to go to NYU when I was 18 years old and I, and I left in 2017. So I, I lived there for a very, very long time. Um, and I went to LA and then after the whole COVID thing, I moved to Florida. Um, but while I was in New York, I, I used to work on spring and, um, and Elizabeth, and I used to go down to this little sandwich uh, shop on Sullivan street and almost every day or like at least twice or three times a week, I would see the chin uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Giganti uh, walking around in his bathrobes, you know, did you ever have an interaction with him? Because every time we would see him, he would make eye contact with you, you know, and, and he would walk alone, you know, but he would always have his little beret 
uh, on his little hat. You know, I'm not sure if it was a beret, but it was like a little hat and, and, and like a bathrobe. And he would walk around by himself, you know, and like somebody told me once, yo, you know, that that's a very famous like, you know, like mobster. And I was like, really, that guy? And then, of course, I looked him up and I was like, oh, my God, this guy's like, you know, like a legend. Did you ever have any contact with him? Well, let me tell you this. Chin, Chin at one time during my time in that life was the most powerful guy in, in all of that life. Right. Um, he was yeah, the godfather. He was the guy. Yeah, he, he was the guy. I had two encounters with Chin, both of them very pleasant. A uh, good friend of mine, Fritzi Givinelli, who was a made guy and he was under Chin. He was a captain in that family. Uh called me one day. He was a bookmaker and he said, Chin wants to see you. And, and his family was the Lucchese family or no, the uh, Genovese. Genovese. Okay. Genovese family. So um, I met uh, Fritzy and then he took me down to, uh, to meet Chin and we walked up and down Houston street. He was in right. his bathrobe. And what happened at the time, again, a long story short, um, I was making a lot of money in the gas business. And, you know, I knew fat Tony who was his, the boss of the Genovese at that time, who also answered to Chin. Um, and he said, you know, Tony speaks very well of you and I have a lot of respect for your father. He said, I heard you're having some trouble with Persico and your family. And I was, you know, I'm making a lot of money. So with money, people are questioning you all that time. And I said, well, Chin, it's okay. You know, he said, listen, if you have any trouble at all, I'll bring you into the Genovese family. You'll be one of my captains right here. Just give me the word and that's done. Oh, that's wow. how he was. And I said, no, I'm okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. And I re appreciate it. I thought it was a, you know, a really nice offer on his part. And um, so nothing came of it. I didn't go that route, but then I met him one other time again with Fritzy. I happened to be with Fritzy. We went to see Chin. So, I mean, look, he, he was crazy as a fox. I can tell you that. <laughs> you know, no question. He was very, very smart guy. I can talk about it now because he's, he's gone. Uh, but listen, you know, I, I told people, Michael said, you think he was a little crazy? I said, listen, if you could play crazy for 30 years and get away with it, you got to be a little crazy, right? Oh, for sure. That's for sure. He, made him. he was uh, he was a very smart guy. No yeah. Doubt. And, and, and it's like so many times, like I, I, I can close my eyes and see it. He would walk right by yeah. you and he'd look at you right in the I eyes. Mean, he, he always made eye contact with you. He never like looked down and looked away. He just always, if you walk by him, He'll look at you right in the face. <laughs> you know, I'll never forget that. Um, yeah. Did, did, um, it, my experience sorry, with him. Yeah, no, I'm just saying my experience with him was was very good, very pleasant. Yeah. So would, would, would that happen a lot where like, you know, there's five families, there's capital regimes in the in the five families. Would would they be allowed to hop from family to family or was that a very special rare case if that ever it's, happened? It was a rare case. I mean, you don't jump ship. I mean, in Sammy Gabano's case, he was originally with the Columbos. Mm. And, uh, you know, there was some trouble brewing with without getting into detail with something that they alleged that he did. And he would have been in trouble with us. There was somebody asking for his uh, his life, from what I understand. And that's when he was, uh, you know, taken into the uh, uh, the Gambino family by, uh, you know, a, a powerful guy there. So. Uh, but he didn't jump ship. That's just the way it worked out. It wasn't. It was frowned upon if you jump ship like that. It didn't happen often. Right. It was yeah. more like a like a like a football team trading type situation. Right? Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. I would I would say that it didn't happen often at all. So so you also, I also want to learn a little bit about when you kind of decided to to make this leap into kind of starting your own little YouTube media empire. What kind of got you started on wanting to make your own content? And then and then you got really good at it. And I'm assuming now because I've owned two YouTube businesses, you know, there's guys that have to do the cuts and there's guys that have to do the thumbnails and you got to upload it and you got to like, you know, make sure that the ads are turned on. Like, do you have a whole little operation that that just focuses on that for you? I have a team. Yeah. But let me let me give you a little background. Yeah. Um, the pandemic hits, I had, you know, as you know, I'm a pretty prolific speaker for the past 25 years. Well, yeah, I normally do. I'm on the road about 40 weeks out of the year, um, you know, all over the world. And when the pandemic came, I was shut down. We had 40 some odd dates that were postponed. And uh, my team called me up. Uh, we had not been on YouTube. 
and said, Michael, what are you going to do? I said, nothing. I'm going to stay home. I haven't been home like this in 20 some odd years. I'm <laughs> having a ball, you know, my wife was happy, everybody. So no, you can't do that. We got to start a YouTube channel. And I said, I don't want to do YouTube, man. I'm not into social media. And uh, originally this was like in June and I resisted. And then finally they talked me into it. So we started it, I, I think late August of the year of, of the pandemic. And it just blew up, Mark. I, I can't explain it. Uh, I, you know, and quite honestly, my wife does all my video work. She, she films it. And then my team, we have an editor and we have people that do all the postings and all that. I'm not involved in that. But they have to chase me around with the camera. If you notice, if you go on YouTube, I haven't done one in a week. And today they're all coming down on me. When I leave the show, I got to go downstairs and film three or four uh, of, uh, you know, video stories. Because you know, I'm not crazy about being in front right. of the camera, believe it or not. But the, the channel blew up. I can't explain it. Uh, you know, we got over a million subs. People it's love amazing. it. And, uh, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm very pleased with in the last uh, few weeks or months, I should say, I started to move away from mob stories totally. I'll mm -hmm. still sprinkle them in. But, you know, I've told so much. I, I'm not going to make up stories. You know, I'm not going to do that. But I've been dealing a lot more with uh, talking about current issues from my perspective and my Which perspective. Which I think is great for the great. record. I think I think you do a great job with that. And, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to say that sometimes you'll take on topics like of a, you know, of a figure. Um, you did this one topic totally like not random, but it was like some, you know, some some bad guy from some other country and your insights into other people, into movies that are even outside of the mob stuff are very, very interesting. You know, I think that's maybe why people want to keep watching. Well, thank you. And yeah, I, I just went to see the movie uh, Sound of Freedom. And, I've heard uh, some very good things about it. Yeah, it's a, definitely, I, I definitely recommend it. And I'm going to be doing a review on it today. It'll post uh, probably Monday. But, you know, I have a different perspective on, on when I see something like that. A lot of people are praising the movie. A lot of people are knocking the movie. People on the left are saying it's QAnon and all this stuff. And which boggles my mind, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, uh, you know, okay. if you don't like, if you don't, if you have trouble with the uh, production, that's one thing. But and there's always dramatic liberty taken. But the fact that a film like that is highlighting a very serious issue that we have that nobody can deny with human mm -hmm. trafficking, people should support the film because it's bringing attention to a, an evil that we need to deal with as a society. And, you know, that's my take on it. And, you know, having come from the street, there was a lot of things in there that I know to be true. I know how people operate, Mark. Yeah. You know, I know the criminal mind because I had one. So right. I understand it. And uh, I know how people operate. So uh, but, you know, that's just that's just a, an example of things that we do. We've got a lot of other things, you know, just to, to give you something, may, somebody you may want an interview. There's a fellow by the name of uh, Billy D'Elia, who mm. just wrote a book and uh, he he took over for Russ Buffalino in Buffalo. And um, I read an excerpt from the book. And in that he talks about Russ Buffalino's involvement in The Godfather, mm. that actually Marlon Brando had. Uh, contacted Russ and and uh, modeled his character after Russ Buffalino. Oh, and, really? Yeah, and D'Elia says some things that I said in my review. I said, I didn't know this. I'll be honest with you. I was around. I'm first hearing it. I said, I'm not going to deny it. I, I, you know, it's possibly very true. But as soon as that hit, I got contacted from his people. And they thanked me for highlighting the book and, and all right. that kind of stuff. And I'm probably going to sit down with him and do an interview with him. He's an old timer. You know, he's retired and all of that. But uh, he sent me a copy of the book. I'm going to get into it. But, uh, you know, so listen, it's YouTube is the is the without a doubt, the biggest platform in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I can't tell you, I did a two month tour in uh, United Kingdom last year. We did about 17 dates. People were walking out of pubs on the street and grabbing me to come in. And I, I get into a taxi and the taxi driver says, uh, Mr. Francis, you don't have to pay me. Just give me an autographed copy of your book. And I'm saying, <laughs> I can't, you know, I go into airports now and people are noticed and it's all YouTube. So my advice to anybody, if you can, if you want a platform and you can build it on YouTube to bring attention to what it is you're doing, do it. 
spend the time. It's well worth it. Yeah, because I think your message is a very positive one. Uh, because it's not just here, listen to my all my stories about my criminal past. It's really listen to my story about my reformation from being in that past into becoming a good person, right? Which is, I think, that redemption arc is very uh, inspirational, right? Because we all feel like we can become better people. And we all know that to become a better person requires a lot of work and usually very difficult, something very difficult to happen to make it happen. And, and uh, yeah, I think it's a very, very inspirational, um, you know, you know, story. And then of course, when you sit down and kind of, you know, do your fire, you know, fireside chats about the life, it's fascinating because we know that you were there, you know, and, and, you know, Hollywood, you know, has given us so many great uh, films about this that like, we just want more, you know, it, it's funny that there hasn't been any real, interesting like mafia related stuff really since the Sopranos, I think was probably like the last sort of big one, you know, and, and there hasn't been much, uh, you know, since, but did you ever watch the Sopranos? I know that you did a review on it. So I actually know the answer to that question, but. Yeah. You know, I never, I be honest with you. I didn't watch every episode, all five, six seasons, whatever it was. Uh, I started watching it when it first came out. And uh, I, I tell you a quick story, how smart I am. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's his name? David Chase. I get out of prison. I'm on parole. And a friend of mine had me working at the Universal lot. I was reading scripts because I had a year on parole and my good friend didn't want me to get in any trouble. He says, come here every day, sit, read scripts, you know, and, and uh, finish out your parole. So while I was on the lot, David Chase called me oh, and he wow. said, yeah, through my agent. And he said, uh, we're doing this film. We're doing this series for Fox and we would like you to participate as a consultant. And whatever it is, I turned it down at the time. Oh, and, man. You know, the history, Fox said no. And right, then Fox, said, Fox passed on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would say that's how smart I was right at that time. But uh, but anyway, I watched the first season, and I liked it. Um, but then I, I don't know, I kind of got not turned off on it, but I said, okay, I know the life. Why do I got to watch it every week? Right, and, right. Uh, but then I started going back and watching individual episodes. And, uh, you know, look, what, what really affected me, what I thought was the best in all of these, all of these movies and all of these series is mm -hmm. the family story. Mm -hmm. You know, the dynamic between Tony and his, and his wife and the kids and the, the whole family aspect is what's appealing to me. And I think appealing to most people. The bottom line right. is they want to see that, you know, you have issues too and so on and so forth. And, you know, I just spoke uh, Tuesday night. I spoke uh, at a ministry event in front of 500 men. Hmm. And, um, you know, we're doing a, a series of these. I'm doing the next three Tuesdays in a row I'll be doing that. But 500 men showed up, 300 registered, 500 showed up. And I can tell you this, the biggest issue that people call me about, and it, it has to do with this transformation, Michael, how did you transform? How did you forgive yourself for the things you did in the past? How do you forgive others? How could you move on? It's a it's a dynamic that so many people struggle with. So yeah, I think they see because I was able to do that by the grace of God and live a you know normal life and have some success and have a family, people are attracted to that yeah. because they want it for themselves. So the best I have to offer is, hey, this is how it worked for me. And hopefully it can work for you the same way. And that resonates, Mark. It resonates. And I think it's my calling in life. I think that's what it's really all about with me. Because, look, you know, the chances, you don't leave that life and walk away. You, you just don't. You know, right. not when you're entering a program and, and having all that stuff to deal with mentally and emotionally and people being upset with you. And uh, I, I just have been so fortunate to be able to be where I am. And, and people are attracted to that. And if you kind of had to give, like, like put, like, one, w like, thought or word on it, like, what's the thing that kind of got you over that hump? You know, when, when, you know, because that's what I've been personally fascinated by is that when you're at your darkest point and it's still dark all around you, what's that one thing that you hear? Because, like, you had a very interesting anecdote that when you were in solitary confinement, you would hear things that were quite scary and that would make you question 
like your, you know, your existence and your life and whether you want it even to keep on going. What was that one thing that you heard in your con in your subconscious that gave you the strength to say, you know what, I'm going to get through this? Well, listen, you know, I, I've always said this. It's it's very good in life to have healthy fears of things that are bad for you. Mm. Example, I have a healthy fear of drugs. Why? Because my sister died of an overdose. My brother, a drug addict for 25 years, put me, I can't even begin to tell you the horrors that we had to go through uh, myself personally because of my brothers and sisters, a uh, brother and sister. And, and uh, of course, when so many other people, I saw it. So I have a healthy fear. I don't want to touch a drug. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll be addicted. Maybe I'll like it. I don't have an addictive personality, but who knows, you know? So why, why test it? So I stay right. away. I have a healthy fear of gambling. I've seen more people destroy their lives gambling than anything else. Mm -hmm. Destruction. I've seen it around me all the time. I don't gamble. Don't want to gamble. You know, and again, I don't have an addictive personality, but I'm careful. So I'm in the hole and I developed a healthy fear of hell. Mm. Because in the Bible, you know, it's very real. Jesus talks more about hell than he does about heaven. And I said, hey, this could be a real place. I don't want to go there. So it motivated me to study and learn. And what I didn't want to do with Christianity, I said, look, this is not a crutch. I'm not going to make myself feel better by reading all these feel good things and think, OK, I'm OK. No, I'm a realistic guy. I'm a guy that says, Sh tell me the bad news before the good news so I can try to fix it. I want to deal with it right up front. I don't procrastinate. Tell me what it is so I can deal with it. Right. And so it motivated me to read further and to learn. And that's what I did for three years. And so what, what it is now, the voice I kept hearing is, is this all true? Uh, do you have it? Is this real? And what motivates me now is that I feel very secure in where I'm going to be. I'm 72 years old. Life is getting shorter for me, no matter how you cut it. Yeah, I'm in great physical health. You, you really are, man. You look great. You know, you like, like, like you look like you do exercise, and you well, know, I you know, I work out. I mean, I'm blessed that my wife and my daughters are all exercise freaks. It's their lifestyle, so they keep me healthy, and I'm concerned about that. I want to be around as long as God allows it. So, uh, but the time is getting shorter. Yeah. So I want to know that I want to be secure in, in the afterlife because. I tell people all the time, I said, think of the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life, the worst time, the worst era, the worst of anything, and picture that never ending, never mm -hmm. ending, but a thousand times worse, something we can't even we can't even process to how bad it could be. So, yeah, that motivates me. And it's in a healthy way that it motivates me. But beyond that, I truly believe in what I believe in in uh, in my faith. So. Uh, it inspires me it, it, in, in every which way. And what I kept, uh, you know, now now I'm going to be honest with you. I do a lot of ministry work all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mark, I can get off the stage sometime. I got off the stage one time. There was about 10,000 people in attendance. And I'm not kidding, Mark. As I'm walking up the stage, people were jumping over their seats to try to grab a hold of me. And right. I, never, I never witnessed anything like that. And, and we were in a church setting. The security was starting to get rough with these people. And I said, hey, we're in a church. They're, they're, it's OK. Don't worry about it. You know, right. But but when I got off the stage, I'll never forget. We went into the green room and my wife looked at me and she's a strong woman of faith. And she said, just remember this, my dear husband. I said, what? She said, you're a lot more blessed than you are good. Mm. And I, I said, you know, well, what? I just got chills. That's a powerful that's a powerful line. Well, Mark, I want to tell you something. As Christians, we believe that one day we're going to stand in front of Jesus, and he's the final judge of, of our lives here. And there is a passage in the Bible that's very scary. And people have stood in front of the Lord, and they said, Lord, you know, I, I drove out demons in your name. I did this, and I did that, and all this for you. And Jesus looked at them and said four words, and those four words were, I never knew you. And I believe that that was a challenge to the heart. That means that whatever they were doing, they were doing for themselves mm. and not their own glory and not for the glory of God. So that's a constant check and balance I have on myself. Because, look, when you get older, you start to face things and say, you know what? You're not young anymore. And, and there is a reality in life. And if this is what you believe, then you better would, you better calm yourself down, get 
get your ego out of the way. Um, I, I think one of the strongest character traits in people of prominence and substance and power is humility. Mm -hmm. I agree. Humility is such a wonderful, wonderful character trait, especially of people that have power. And when I see that, I'm so attracted to it um, that I try to balance myself that way. I said, listen, you know, and, and there's a difference. I tell people, too, there's a difference between having confidence and being arrogant. Mm -hmm. I respect people with confidence and you can ha you can be humble and have a lot of confidence. I don't respect people that are arrogant. I don't like that. It's a turn off to me. I don't care who you are at that point. You don't have you, you know, I, I don't have a good feeling about you. So these are the checks and balances I put on myself. And hopefully, uh, you know, it'll work out for me. That's that's all I can say. Yeah. Look, those are very powerful words. It's a lot to soak in. And you've been so generous with your time. I'm almost out of it here. And I just want to thank you one more time, Michael Francis, for uh, for joining me, giving me a little, you know, a little bit of your very valuable time. And this was awesome, man. You know, I could have. I'm quite the scholar on some of the mob stuff. I could have gone so deep on that, but I actually wanted to learn a little bit more about your growth, you know, as a person, because you can tell that that's what people really resonate when it comes to you and your work is, is, is your positive message. Not so much like there's a, you know, my favorite line in the Sopranos probably is one time Tony Soprano says, you know, remember when is the lowest form of conversation. You know, and it, it, it's just it, it's it, it's the episode is called Remember When, but mm -hmm. he just throws it out there because all his boys were always talking about the old times and remember this guy, remember that guy. And it was an episode where Tony leaves the friends and kind of goes off on his own little journey. And that's what sparks him. Right. He's like, remember when's the lowest form of conversation. And, mm -hmm. you know, and with you, I think the more interesting stuff is your stuff about how you've grown as a person and. Anyway, it's really inspirational, and I thank you so much for your time. And, uh, you know, again, to my audience, please go check out his YouTube channel if you haven't already checked it out. It's it's quite amazing, and there's a ton of content on it. Like, you you do videos, what, like a couple times a week they got you doing videos? Yeah, we well, other than this past week where I was just so busy, uh, we post twice a week at least. And, and people uh, come but, after you if you don't post, right? Like, like don't oh, knock down your house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be filming right after this, and we're going to put a few of them together. But, uh, Mark, I appreciate it, really. Thank you. And we could do this again sometime. Oh, and that'd I, be great. I, I want to invite you to something. You're in Florida? I am in Florida, correct. Where about? So, currently, um, I bought myself a house uh, in the Florida Keys. Oh, uh, great. Because I used to make video games, and, and I made a very successful one a long time ago. And uh, that's what I did with the money of that game is I bought this house. And when I left L.A., I kind of came here to sort of regroup and figure out what I'm going to do next. I might go back to New York. I have this love for New York that I'll never shake. But, um, yes, I am currently in the Florida Keys, in Isla Morada, which is kind of like the northern Keys. Well, I love the Keys. Uh, I spent uh, about a week and a half there, uh, three years, just before the pandemic. I love oh, okay. it. Anyway, um, I want to just alert you to something on September 28th. I don't know if you know this, but I've recently put a platform together with Mike Tyson. That, oh, I uh, didn't know that. Yeah, it's called Champions Corner, and we're going to be launching it in um, uh, in about two weeks. And there's two aspects. There's the there's a subscription platform, and then Mike and I and Chaz Palminteri, my friend, are going to be doing oh, live. I love Chaz. I love yeah, Chaz. We're, we're going to be doing live events. And uh, the first one is at the Beacon Theater on September 28th in New York. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to be around, fine. The second one is going to be at the uh, James L. Knight Center in Miami. So right, that, legendary place. Yeah. And um, so if, if you happen to come up, uh, you'll be my guest at the show. I just want to let you know that. Oh, Michael, I, I, I love that. I actually might be in New York because I because because I do still do some stuff in the movies. And I, I kind of have to go to New York in September. Um, so I actually might be in New York, you know, for that 28th and I'll take you up on that because I, yeah. I, I'd love to meet you in person and, and I'm honored to, you know, to be your guest. Well, just, just reach out to me if you happen to be there and I'll set it up for you. I think it's going to be a great show. Uh, and Mike is, uh, is totally dedicated to this and the, and the platform is all about helping people in their personal development and transformation. 
mm-hmm. you know, Marcus, what a transformation there. Yeah. And then uh, also career and business development. We have good people involved with us. Uh, so it's going to be kind of a one stop uh, place for mentorship and anything that we can help people with. We're, we're going to be doing. So we're excited about it. And um, yeah, maybe maybe one time too in the next couple of weeks we can jump on there and talk about Champions Corner. Maybe I can bring my com with me. Oh you- man, that would be that would be amazing. That would be amazing. You know, my my audience is really young filmmakers, um, you know, video game folks, and typically all my guests. And you know, I've had a, a, a an incredible array of guests. It's always about how do you create? You know, how do you make stuff? You know, sure. like. How do you inspire yourself to like kind of make your dreams come true? You know, it's like, you know, that's what I get, you know, off on, you know. So, man, I I appreciate that so much. I have to shout out A Bronx Tale because Chaz Pemontari in A Bronx Tale is just like probably one of my favorite depictions of a mob. Right. Like that one scene where they're in the, uh, you know, in the bar and he, you know, the guy says, we're just trying to have a drink. He's like, oh, you just want to drink. Fine, fine. And then he said, well, now I'm not going to, you know, he, he tells him, well, now you're not going to be able to leave. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's the famous line. It's now you just can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you, you'll appreciate this. You know, he and I, Chaz and I started our own YouTube channel. Oh, wow. It's okay. Well, the wise and the wise guy. Okay. Yeah. So when you, when you have some time. A, jump a on totally that. separate YouTube channel. Man, I didn't even know totally about this. Separate. Yeah. We started it about five, six weeks ago. And uh, it's doing really well. People are, uh, what we do, uh, we take some of the greatest books that were ever written, right? And we take five or six key elements from that book. And he and I discuss those elements from our perspective. So I think you'll enjoy it. Oh, People wow. It's really a great concept. It. It's a great yeah, they're concept. Really, they're really loving it. So it's called, jump- it's called The Wise and the Wise Guys? The wise and the Wise Guy, yeah. Uh, oh, man. I, I'm going to check that out today. Yeah, you, Michael. you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for your time, sir, man. I'm honored and so appreciative. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. And stay in touch and uh, hope to see you in September. Cool. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, brother. Thank you.